Yo, light is crazy shit, yo. Light is crazy shit. I want to let everybody know for this episode of the Hood Health Podcast that I have someone here who is literally um, part, of the, part of my inspiration in terms of my whole writing career, you know, in terms of the blog that she used to keep online. That was part of my inspiration for seeing that, um, you know, there was a place for me and for the message that I wanted to get across. And, um, and the blog was only the beginning because then through the blog, I found out who she was and realized I was reading about her, you know, reading her work all along. I am talking about none other than Hualeja, who is on here with me. And if you don't know her, um, you need to, you know, get yourself right and, um, and uh, just learn more about her. But what's funny is that I'm a... I'm going to drop a few things about her, but the reality is, is I'm going to miss something. I'm going to miss something because there's just so much that she has done. Um, but specifically we rounded, um, back around and we intersect with each other, not just over hip hop, but over, um, hood health and health issues, the golden nutrients. We're going to get into all that. Anyway, this woman here. All right. First of all, she's written for you know, edited Stress Magazine. Uh, she's written for Complex, The Source. Um, I, I'm missing, man. I know I'm missing periodicals. Um, A&R for, you know, your MC's favorite MC, you know, um, MF Doom. Um, right now, I know that she intersects a lot with a lot of work, working with the hieroglyphics um, crew out West. And, um, you know, and there's just so much more. But the the one of the main things that you need to know about this woman is that yo, she can throw down in the kitchen. Okay, <laughs> you all need to know that because um, it, it's like next level. All right, and then just on like you know the health tip, all that just intersects with hip hop and everything. Thank you for agreeing to come on the Hood Health Podcast, Walaja. I am so happy to have you here. Well, peace and life. I'm so happy to be on here, especially to be talking about health and food and the golden nutrients and how our works have intersected over the many, many years. Um, because, you know, talking about food and nutrition and better health is something that's like a core to my existence my whole life. And it's something that you know, drove me to stay in the music industry and stay in the publishing industry. Although I never wrote for any culinary magazines or anything like that, which was always my dream. Um, mm -hmm. I was able to make so much impact with a lot of people's favorite musicians and artists behind the scenes. And also with a lot of other journalists and editors and just in all different kinds of platforms or really anytime anyone, whether they would be an artist or someone at a media company where I worked would get sick. And then they, results they were looking for from Western medicine and from big pharma, or they knew that they needed more than just a pill or some kind of procedure to get past that hurdle of their health that they needed to change their lifestyle and change their eating habits and cut out a lot of things that weren't working for them health-wise. And they knew that about me, no matter, right. you know, we didn't necessarily have to be working at a, at a culinary publication or I didn't even have to be doing the catering or the private chefing or the green room at a record label or at a recording studio, but people knew about me and they knew that I lived that healthful lifestyle and that it was passed down genera generationally to, to me through my the matriarchal line of my family, that I learned most of this from my 
grandmother and about in terms of herbs and holistic healing and health and everything um, about, you know, Eastern medicine, acupuncture, just uh, living off the land, foraging, um, knowing about the native uh, plants and herbs and roots and trees wherever you're at, wherever you live. Right. I learned so much of that from my granny. And you know what? I think we all did. But some people right. forgot. Right. Right. And it's it's funny that you mentioned that in terms about that that period of forgetting, right? Because I feel like that's similar to my journey also um, in terms of there went through a period where I was like, I realized I wanted to focus more on health, right? I, I realized that the way that I wanted to focus on health, the the Western lens wasn't fully accommodating to me, mm -hmm. right? And, and even in terms of like their definition of certain things, even though I saw elements in terms of that resonated me within it, I'm like, that's not fully, fully me. Right. So, for instance, you know, the um, the popular image of veganism, right, um, as very, very, a very, very white kind of uh, portrayal of it. I knew that there were elements in there that I was like, OK, I can rock with that. But there was other elements I was just like, that seems really, really a little kind of colonizer typey. Mm -hmm. Right. And then at a certain point, like you said, you know, I'm like, wait a minute there are resources like this in my own community and also in my family, my, my, my family lineage, you know, both of my parents grew up on farms, mm. you know? So, so like there's little things that, Oh wait, mom used to do this or, or dad used to do this. And I'm like, Oh shoot. I knew some of this stuff, mm -hmm. you know? And, and it was kind of like a remembering also, like you said, like a lot of us, a lot more of us have this connection um, than um, fully realize it. You know? We really, really do. And I, I received so much training and information from my grandmother by default because I was the only woman in my generation. One brother, uh... four, four male cousins. There were no other... Uh, girls in my entire generation, very small family. Um, so she really took the time and the energy and said to me, you know, you're young, but I want you to learn about not just growing foods. My grandmother had a, an amazing home where I was born um, in Laurel Canyon and my grandfather built for her had well had built for he wow. designed and had built for her and it was on the top of a mountain and i'm sure you've probably seen on my socials that photograph of my mother on her burrow yeah a black and white picture of my mom so that was back in the yeah. 50s and she was on her burrow but that was in the backyard of my my grandmother and grandfather's yard and so the mountain was our home and mm. there were things growing there naturally. And then there were things mm -hmm. that my, my granny planted close by to the house. And these were things that were, for, for us children, delicious. You know, we would see right. blueberries or sh wild strawberries. And we had kumquat tree and all kinds of citrus. And for kids, you know, visiting my granny house, we'd, me and my cousins and my brother running around, we'd say, oh, look, there's strawberries. Oh, there's kumquat. Oh, delicious. And, you know, we would grab the food and eat it. But... Later on, she also taught me what she learned. She was an organizer and activist, and she spent a lot of time working with the Diné people, the not what most people call the Navajo tribes. And she went to their land um, and to what is now called, you know, their reservations. And she worked with a lot of their their chiefs and important people doing um, organizing. So they would come to her pad, and there would be leaders of the Black Panther Party there. There would be leaders of what would later become GLAAD, which was a, you know, a, a gay and lesbian alliance. And most people would think, oh, well, that doesn't sound possible. But that was what my grandmother did was she organized uh, leaders from all of these different people who all were, you know, working as activists and who all had these important political agendas. And this was kind of, in a way, you know, a trade. People would 
invite her to their places and she would go to theirs and she would learn from their cultures. And uh, she was a professor and, you know, she, she was very um, interested in, in uniting people for a common cause. And as a child, mm -hmm. I sometimes didn't really understand the groupings of people that were at her home. And sometimes I didn't really know exactly what was going on, but I always felt the importance. And when I got a little bit old enough, she told me that she wanted to teach me the things about indigenous plants and roots and herbs and um, animals, everything that she had learned from the Diné and also the things that she had learned from us living on that land because mm -hmm. she had that whole mountaintop and I was born at home. My mother had me at home on the floor. There were no doctors, no needle, no nurse, no hospital, right. just my auntie and my mother and a natural birth. And, um, you know, my mother smoked herb during the pregnancy and during the childbirth itself. And, and, you know, I, I had a very, um, blessed childhood in that way that I literally grew up on the mountain sides. Every home right. in my family was on a mountain and that was the way we lived. And if you were hungry as a child and you wanted a snack, I'm mm -hmm. blessed because my mother would say, well, go to the backyard. There's orange growing, there's lemon, there's uh, some, there's some herbs back there. There's some fruits. And, you know, we were taught early on to identify what you could and could not eat. And I think most children are so disconnected from that. Oh yeah, no, definitely. Definitely. Um, it's funny because I was just talking to someone just recently. Um, my father, um, you know, he wouldn't eat fast food meat. Mm. I, he, if, if, if it didn't come from a butcher, he, he wouldn't eat it. Um, and I, I, I mentioned this on that one that we have generations now that are so disconnected from your food source and everything that they may have never even cooked. They don't even understand, even if they eat meat, they don't even understand oh, what part of the pig does the ham come from, the bacon come from. Like they don't even understand structures and stuff like that. They don't even, they've never seen meat outside mm. of pl plastic and styrofoam. You know what I'm saying? So if they're that disconnected from meat, you know, in terms of vegetation and stuff, we walk by edible stuff, you know, most of the day, mm -hmm. even if you're in, even if you're in the inner city, there's stuff growing that, you know, mm -hmm. edible. Um, but like you said, there's this disconnect, um, that is real, real heavy right now. Um, and so one of the easiest ways to, to rectify that is just to go backwards. Like we just have to reconnect, you know, um, to that and bring that back center. Can you speak a little bit in terms of, we're going to jump a little bit. I want to, I want, I want to, I want to make the connections in terms of, uh, your place in hip hop because I like like I, I'm gonna say it here I you're a valuable your 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 place in hip hop is very very instrumental and um I don't think a lot of platforms have kind of put that on Front Street I want to put it on Front Street all right because I think I think it's important um because it kind of ties everything together. You know, you're not just some random person who, you know, um, took notes in, you know, some hip hop office. You know, you're part of the structure of, the, of, of hip hop history and you're connected to um, a lot of people that people would know. And, and if they play the whole like six degree of separations, you know what I'm saying? They're all connected to you in various different ways. So if you could just speak a little bit just about, you know, how you intersect, you know, with hip hop so that then I could go also then, you know, we could go from there in terms of, you know, how you were able to use that presence in hip hop to then bridge the gap and bring that kind of health element, you know, to those in hip hop. Sure, of course. Um, well, first of all, my father is a very renowned uh, jazz player. Um, he's considered by many people to be one of the uh, fathers of free jazz. I've seen that that quotation used a lot. Um, he was mm -hmm. in a quartet with Cecil Taylor for a long time, a lot of different various personnel, uh, but he worked a lot with Archie Shepp and he played, mm -hmm. I mean, my father played with Billie Holiday, Frank Sinatra, Barbara Streisand, Beyonce, Barry uh -huh. White, Earth, Wind & Fire, 
Tower Yo. of Power, Jerry Garcia, um, Frank Zappa, the Boston Philharmonic, Los Angeles uh, Philharmonic Symphony Orchestra in L.A. Um, he was the principal bassist on every X-Files episode, most Disney films and what? television shows in the 80s. Um, very, very renowned in many, many genres of music. The bass player on the entire Eagles Hotel California album, the OJ's oh, Christmas dear. records. He played all the bass on those. Um, he, very, very renowned bass player in rock music, in soul music, in R&B, in jazz, in free jazz and bebop, uh, and, and also in classical. He started as a child prodigy as a classical musician. Uh, so... I was born into the music business and into music mm. and art itself. My mother was a drummer. She recorded one album with my father and my godfather, Marty Crystal, who's a very well-known saxophone player. Um, and that was the only recording she made because then um, I was born and two years later, my brother and she just ended up being um, a mother and did not continue, you know, the journey as a, a musician and artist. Um, so I literally like my whole life grew up in recording studios, sound stages in the pit at orchestras, at music festivals. And like, I mean, one of my earlier memories was um, my father taking my brother and I to a studio and parking us, in the lobby with the receptionist because he had a session and he went to record and my brother fell asleep and I was there and I was pretty young, but Quincy Jones was there and he was mixing Michael Jackson records. And wow. I heard the whole thing all day. So, uh, you know, it was the thing where it's like, it's in my blood to be sure, mm -hmm. but also my father was very anti-rap, very anti-hip-hop. He was instrumental in causing problems for rap and hip hop at the Naras and Grammys meetings. He was very well known for being against the music and against, uh, you know, what he really, to me, you know, the parallels are so crazy because his family denounced him for uh -huh. entering into jazz and everything right. that came along with jazz music. And he denounced me for working in hip hop, for, for listening to it, for, you know, being a, a avid lover of rap since a very small child. And I had a chance to have a career as a musician as well. I was a song or, songwriter and singer at a very young age and Motown offered me a demo deal when I was in my teens and I uh, was not allowed to sign the document. My father refused to sign it. My mother tried to have me, you know, emancipated so that I could, she and I could sign it without his uh, permission and the judge denied that. And I kind of gave up on the dream of being an artist at that time. And uh, I just, you know, went along my own path, which was that I was in gangs in Los Angeles. I think that's been pretty well documented in interviews that I've done and people who you know know me in real life from back home know that in my junior high school and high school years, I was an active gang member and um, I was out in the street a lot um, mm -hmm. and I would run into Bronx Style Bob from Rum Syndicate, Ice-T, uh, Evil E, Garcia. Um, they would always be doing these clubs and shows and parties um, out in East Hollywood. And I went to junior high school there and also was, you know, a, in gangs in that area. So I would just be out at night, a young child, um, you know, and so they would see me just out on the street and they probably saw me tagging or with spray paint or markers in my hand before. And they knew that I would, you know, just be out there on the blocks. And so they approached me and they said, well, you're out here all the time and would you like to make a little bit of money passing out these flyers and telling, especially, you know, ladies that walk by to let them know that we're doing a party inside here and that they're very welcome to attend and just stuff like that, you know, and that's, that mm. was my entrance into the music industry, the wow. street, street team and, and street promotions and, and actually being out in the street. And I never ever ever used my father's name or his fame or and there was no nepotism for me because he tried to prevent right. me over and over from getting into the industry and the business and it was just something that was meant to meant to be for me because all throughout uh, my childhood and teenage years I was always ending up around different 
different hip hop artists and really my cousins, I would say, were the most instrumental because I had, like, as, as I mentioned, four boy cousins, all, all older than me. And they were very well-known graffiti artists and very well-known b-boys. And so anytime my mother would bring me to my aunties and she and my auntie would hang out and spend the whole day inside, you know, drinking tea and reading books and doing what their auntie, auntie and mom things. And I would be out there watching my cousins and the same thing, gatekeeping. They would never let me participate. I was the only girl. I was a little younger. They didn't really want me to do graffiti. They didn't want me to break dance. They, I wasn't allowed on the linoleum on the front lawn. I wasn't allowed up the block where they were spray painting the wall. I was allowed to watch and I watched and, I, and that they were the ones who taught me the, you know, the basics of hip hop as a culture, not just rap, not just the music, not just, right. you know, not just what I could hear on K-Day. I'm from LA. So we were blessed. We had a real hip hop radio station, 24, seven, 365. Right. And so, you know, but they brought graffiti from New York. They, their crew had a lot of different um, people from all cultures and backgrounds and also oddly enough, uh, socioeconomic backgrounds. There were wealthy members of their crew all the way down to, you know, the most economically disenfranchised members and everywhere in between. So some of the wealthier members of their crew, it includes David Arquette, the famous actor. He still does graffiti. He's still my cousin's best friend and they still rock, you know, they're <laughs> old rich men, but they still rock him. And, you know, so they would go to New York and take actual photos of the trains and of walls and so I as a youth in LA got to not only see the amazing graffiti that was happening uh from crews like theirs KGB not from not just CBS and West Coast artists and CBS being one of the biggest crews in LA um that I I got to see actual New York graffiti as it happened within a week the photos wow. would be the photos would have been developed, put in the photo albums, passed around by my cousins and their crew. And once again, whenever they would leave the room, I would flip through those books, even though they didn't really want me to. I always <laughs> did. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right, right, right. And so right. that led to me, you know, I went to a performing arts junior high school and part of high school, which was LACES, Los Angeles Center for Enriched Studies. I went to school with the Jazzy Fat Nasties, uh, Cut Chemist, um, a lot of famous actors and actresses went to school with me. I was in school with Shaka Khan's daughter. Um, I had musical theater with Leonardo DiCaprio. He and I starred in a play together. We sang, we acted, oh, oh. I, I danced. So this was all in junior high school. I got those connections because I basically went to the fame school of Los Angeles. Right. Right. But here's right. the thing. It was in South Central. So the kids who lived in that area locally also were invited to attend school there legally. They had it wasn't only performing arts, it was also people who, who were local to that area. So it incorporated a lot of things. We had the LA Dream Team uh DJed our school dances at nutrition time mm. along with along with Greg Mack from K Day. He would come and host. And then every other Friday they had buses chartered and they took us to World on Wheels in South Central to roller skate for two hours. That was our physical education class every other Friday and they took us on a bus. Oh wow. Wow. And okay. so you could not <laughs> take you couldn't, we listened to 1580K Day on the bus every day. And I'm coming from right. the mountain. I'm still in the mountains. I'm coming from the mountains right. on a bus. I have to leave at 4.30 in the morning because we're riding through all of Los Angeles on the bus, picking up youth until we get to the school in South Central. And then when we get there, every Tuesday, nutrition time dance, the LA Dream Team is DJing. Like these are like, it's yes. actually, a, DJ Aladdin. It's like they're, the people, these people are, at our school and then they're DJing World on Wheels or they have a pre-made uh, two-hour mix for us to skate to. And so we heard JJ Fad and all this music before it even was on the radio. We were roller skating to it. Right, right. Wow. 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 So all these things are happening at the same time. And I'm, it, it, was, it was much, much more to me than music or the music industry. Although right. I started to realize that like, Oh, well, I'm not the only one, obviously, with a dad who's, you know, in this business that, you know, I'm, like I said, Chaka Khan's daughter, like she was my classmate. And um, 
I did have dance and some and some musical classes with her. And, you know, I just I, I went to Hanako Williams, Billy Dee's daughter, also was one of my classmates. And so I started to kind of see that there there were ways beyond trying to beg my father to let me into this thing that I was so drawn to. And it just all kind of started, you know, started happening. And I think for me, because it's so genuine and I was always like this, even as a a really young woman in the seventh grade or eighth grade, I was always thinking like, hey, that guy, the DJs, he's in my Latin class. And then I also, in my math class, there's this dude and he does the crazy art. Like he's always painting graffiti during class when he should be paying attention. Why don't I tell them about what the other one is doing? Because he could be the one making the art cover for the DJ. And then that's going to get him more, more burn for his graffiti name. And he's going to get known for his art. I was doing that as a kid, not even understanding that later that was going to mean that I would be an artist and repertoire executive or that I would be the vice president of a record label and distributorship, or that I would be manufacturing artists product. I didn't go to school for that. I didn't, I didn't get to go to college. That was my, Mm -hmm. that was my school. And it wasn't just music or the music business. It wasn't just rap. It was hip hop as a culture and being deeply involved in all the elements, despite the men always trying to make sure that I was not able to be directly involved. Right, right. So how did you, it, this is crazy because I've known you all this time and I, I knew some of that, but I didn't know all of that. <laughs> like, like, like it was, it was basically like you didn't have, you really didn't have any other choice except to do what you ended up doing. You know what I'm saying? Like, like just all those elements you know, pushing from all different directions, it's, it makes perfect sense how you ended up where you ended up. Um, so how did you then make that bridge in terms of the writing aspect? Because that's that's where I linked with you mm-hmm. on. Um, but I, I just also know just from the industry period in terms of writing, um, just how difficult it is period to break in there unless you know someone who knows someone who knows someone and i can't even imagine at that time as a woman how do you get in the door and that just get in the door would be like yeah i'm here you know i'm not just gonna be here for like one little filler piece i'm gonna do some other stuff too you know so how did you get into like the editing right Th- those things that that you know like i connected with you on. <laughs> sure well it really started, I was attending Venice High School and um, it was a international and foreign studies magnet school program that I was, that I was involved in. I, I had to be involved in a magnet school program to get there because I didn't live in Venice. And okay. um, ironically, my friend uh, Jessica Williams and I, we both had... Um, I don't know how to explain, but we were getting in a lot of like trouble at school. We were still keeping up good grades and we were going to classes and we were, you know, doing everything like that, but we were getting involved in a lot of, a lot of stuff. And it went, it went really far that they wanted to give us like a punishment. And so the vice principal came up with this, this special thing that they were going to consider us, you know, as being punished, which was on the weekends, we had to go, to this uh, thing. I think it was called Gateway Academy or something like that. And we had to go on Saturdays and it was a four hours and it was in the morning and they felt like it was a punishment. It turned out to be a journalism program. (laughs) And I already had all the advanced placement English classes and I had the highest SAT English score in the whole district while I was game banging, while I was having the maximum legal allowable number of absences, literally the vice principal told me when I graduated, they were like, man, we want to hold you back so bad. We don't, we do not want to let you graduate. They said the state of California would have violated you if you were, if you missed one more hour of school, you would not have been able. They were like, but we can't stop you that you have the grades, you have the, you have the SAT score. That's crazy that everybody recognizes and we can't stop you. So 
we were in this program and it was, we had to make a newspaper. That was the project. And I had never, I loved to write. I loved to read. I was reading at a college level when I tested for kindergarten. I was already reading at a college level. Um, and so they were reading with me when I was, you know, a, a newborn. And so I wanted to write things and I wrote different poetry and I always had journals and we always had black books for graffiti and I was always writing, you know, writing things even as a little kid, but I never thought of, well, this will be some kind of career path for me or, or I wanted, to, I never really thought of it like that until we had right. this punishment course <laughs> where we made <laughs> the newspaper. And um, so it just kind of stuck with me. And when I was working at, um, Fox Kids and Fox Family. I was an executive assistant to the vice president of on-air promotions. And it was a very good executive position that I had gotten from a temp agency. And it was, uh, you know, in the office with big producers and directors and people who were, it, turned, it ended up being purchased. And now it's Disney slash ABC owns it. And Saban, yeah. they bought it all together. But when I was there, Haim Saban was in charge of the whole company. And then my boss was one of the, you know, bigger bosses who basically decided what commercials would be produced in house and which ones would be purchased. And it was, you know, a very important job, but he realized early on that I was involved somehow in music industry. And he also wanted to like encourage my path, which I think he could tell was not being his secretary forever. <laughs> right. So he actually invested in me, not just financially, but he actually gave me money to help me get started, which was taking photos for Stress Magazine and developing the photos and attending events, which often back in those days, because I was just getting started, uh, and also for platform.net, like I attended Coachella and I shot Coachella and I had to develop the film back in those, the first Coachella, it was still film. We didn't have the digital cameras. Um, wow. And he, this man paid for that. And he allowed me to take big, big paid leave, unpaid leave, sick leave, anything and, and everything to go on location, to go to Atlanta, to interview an artist, to take three hours out of my work day and sit at my desk and do an interview because he was the boss and nobody could really right. say anything. But that man, Fred Poston was his name. And he really saw something in me and believed in me. And he really facilitated. He really was a benefactor and he really helped me. It got me on platform.net, which got me noticed uh, by stress and, um, you know, that also the fact that I was working in that field at that time, although it was a administrative and unimportant position, I was online. A right. lot of a lot of our people were not online. They didn't know anything about an email, a website. Um, right. They did not know. And it all ties in together uh, with our with our culture, too, because back in those days, at the same time that I was doing that. I was also in the message boards, uh, both the Wu-Tang message board and the early, early 5% Nation of Gods and Earth message board that DRE, a law out of Georgia had. I was yeah. in that from the beginning, from the beginning. I, I, I remember, you know, what's so funny that you're mentioning all that because I don't remember exactly the first time. <laughs> you know, whatever, but you're mentioning all these places like, oh yeah, I was there too. I was mm -hmm. there. Oh, yeah, yeah. But yeah, like your digital footprint in terms of online definitely is extensive because there's a certain point that you could take people back to and it drops off. You can kind of tell when people like got on in mass, but you're right. As a whole, at that time, a lot of us were online like that, and especially not those places. It was rare. It was it was very few and far between. And there were there were so so few avenues then to really be able to even figure out how to start to get online because it was dial up and it was AOL. And if our family had access to that, which meant that you had a higher uh, socioeconomic bracket, it meant that you had some kind of expendable income in your family. 
but also mm-hmm. the, the timing wise, it was like, I was able to use it at work, but most people who did have access, it was very limited the amount of time because if your parents or elders were the ones providing that internet, oh, they were going to be the ones using it. They were not going to allow you to run wild on their internet that they had to pay for. And, you know, it just wasn't a thing that was going to be possible for people who, even people who had that access, it was limited. And for me, it was unlimited because I was Mm. able to come to work early and be online, stay late at work and be online, sit at my desk for an hour at lunch and eat my food and be online. And, you know, I, I recognized that that was something that really, um, I was able to break, break in and break a lot of barriers. But also I, like I said, I had that patronage, that man was paying giving me cash and giving me opportunities Mm -hmm. for travel and, and basically letting me use the resources at Fox to do this hip hop journalism thing. And that is what gave me the crazy number of clips that I had. And then once I started to realize, Hey, some of these magazines have websites and um, Mm -hmm. Fox was in Westwood and Westwood is in the West side of Los Angeles. And at the time, had two, not one, but two of the largest and most extensive um, newsstands in the country, not even just California, but in the whole country. Only New York had uh, newsstands that could rival the ones in Westwood. So every print magazine about music was there. And again, this is this is help help from him. He would give me his company card and say, Hey, can you bring back variety and billboard and um, Hollywood reporter? These were things he needed to do his job, but he would wink at me and let me know. You also buy all those magazines that you need. My brother, I could never have afforded not even one of those magazines. If I was just trying to, buy them but he would just let me put them on a credit card and just bring them and then take them home with me and they were my property so I had amazing access online and in print and I was able to say wow well I really like herb magazine and and I really think that this 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 print magazine the source and and double XL and vibe I really like those and and I'm I'm gonna look at online and I'm gonna try to find if there's an email and I'm gonna see if there's a way that I can you know contact them and what I was told in the beginning was well you need clips you need proof right. that you can write and again I'm not college educated right right So Mm -hmm. I don't have that at first until I started doing these online ones. And then again, I'm still at Fox. So once I got published a couple of times, I used those color printers huh? Mm -hmm. and that Mm -hmm. mail and that mail room. And I utilized their assets to the fullest potential possible that combined with that man allowing me to purchase all those magazines and get the information off their masses and get their mailing addresses. And I had, unlimited access to that Fox mail room and to those printers. And I made my packages and I sent them to every possible magazine that you could imagine. <laughs> Yo, that's what's up. And, and, and that's also just, that's just a lesson right there. That's just like some insight right there, like to the game, you know, like it really, really also speaks to in terms of knowing the place and the time you're in, because I feel like that same scenario at different times wouldn't have worked. You know what I'm saying? But it was the it was the perfect placement where you were and the perfect time that allowed all that to to you know link together. Now here's the net now I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a big jump <laughs> because I want people to go back and research you. That's why I, that's why I need people to do because I need them to understand that this interview is just like a slice. This is this is just a slice. Um now we jump, okay? So once um, for myself, once we decided with Spring Design Publishing, we're going to do this Hood Health um, book and everything. You, of course, one of the first people I was like, yo, I need while laser on this. You know what I'm saying? Um, when it, my, my, my gears started turning in my head and I was like, Dag, okay, what's all the hip hop that intersects with health and everything? And of course, if we go to speak specifically about hip hop, health, and food. There's one album that we have to speak about. We got to mm-hmm. speak on it. 
because um, it, it, it puts it just all right there. And it, it is so great because still to this day, I'll go up in the spot and I'll pull out that album and that album right there will be my teaching tool. You know, like I'll go right into my, 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 my talks, my workshops or whatever, and people get it mm -hmm. because of MF Doom. So mm -hmm. tell me a little bit in terms of, you know, food, MF Doom, but also specifically also just highlighting in terms of just like how like food and, and, and health was, was part of the whole presence. You know what I'm saying? It was part of the whole, just like, it's, it's part of the whole package. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's gonna, it's gonna segue to those Fox days because, um, those were well, the stories I just told led to me submitting my work to stress magazine. Uh -huh. And so sight unseen cat, the publisher was a famous uh, graffiti artist and he now runs the museum of graffiti in Miami and V V Bravo for Helio Bravo. He was my editor and they, they hired me to write and I, I only did one issue. And then right after I wrote some stuff for that issue, they said, well, we want you to be the West Coast editor. We want you to do all these things and can and come on board. So I, I became officially part of the masthead at Stress. And they are the ones who assigned me an article on KMD. And that's how I met Doom. And that's how I met Grimm. I met Doom and Grimm on the same day. And I shot their picture for Stress. And I did their interview. And I did their coverage. And that's how... We met and we all kept in touch. Um, but before, uh, around really around the same time, I was working with um, Chase Infinite and DJ Khalil mm -hmm. uh, from Self Scientific and Frank Correa Gomez, who was the label head and label owner for SOL Music Works. And Crandon uh, was affiliated with them very closely, recording a lot of music along with Chase and with Self Scientific. And I got a copy of a vinyl record called Love All Law by Self Scientific. And mm -hmm. it was an incredible piece of music. And it had Frank Correa Gomez's phone number on it. And I called the number. <laughs> I called the number and I said, I'm a journalist and I cover hip hop. And I'm uh, born and raised in Los Angeles. And I would really, really love to interview um, these artists on your label who made this record called Love All Law. And they contacted me back. And it found out that their studio was very close to my auntie's house where I was living at the time while I was working at Fox. So um, my family was away for the holidays. I had the whole house to myself. And I said, well, if you wouldn't mind to come and bring the label roster to the house and I will cook for everyone and we'll eat and we'll conduct the interview. And so my first time ever meeting Chase and Khalil and um, and Quanzon and Frank, they came to the house and I was very well prepared because Khalil, who's um, Muslim most of his life or maybe his whole life, um, has also, besides the food habits um, that, uh, that any Muslim would have, also a lot of food allergies. So as soon as I mentioned dinner and food, Frank said, okay, yes, that would be amazing. However, we have these, these situations with these allergies. And then we also with these, you know, with these beliefs, cause they didn't know me or my culture or anything about right. me. And so they were just taking care to explain, you know, that at the time, uh, Chase was a member of 5% nation of Gaza nurse and, uh, mm -hmm. Khalil was, a you know, Muslim and also with those food allergies. And so I had to prepare something that a, was appropriate for everyone's cultural um, eating habit. And then also prepare something that was going to be flavorful and delicious. And then also something that things where Khalil could eat the food because there were so many things he was allergic to. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so um, I made a Mediterranean meal and um, a couple of the things, uh, a couple of the things he couldn't eat, but I, I made tabbouleh salad with couscous. And he always reminds me that it was the first time he had ever uh, eaten couscous before. And so like all those yeah. things, like, so the conversation and the meal itself and the, this factors in, in so, so many ways in my life was like managing when I lived in Brooklyn, managing a crew of MCs and beat makers and DJs who were all 12 tribes Rastas. And so mm. I would go over there 
and they wouldn't even let me cook because the they had right. the elder there cooking it, but he would allow me, you know, he saw that I was covered and that I was Muslim and that I kept clean habits and that I, you know, he, he trust, he trusted me enough after a while to let me be a sous chef in his kitchen and chop up his vegetables for his atal stew. And he, he allowed me to wash dishes and he let me wash vegetables eventually, that right. kind of thing, you know, but it allowed me to learn so many different ways of eating that are cultural and you, those things cannot be separated from hip hop. You cannot and will not mm -hmm. separate Islam. You will not separate uh, Rastafarianism from hip hop. It's not possible. You can't separate the 5% nation of gods and earths, 5% nation. You cannot remove it from hip hop culture. You might want to, but you can't. Right, 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 right. And that's so important in terms of realizing that, um, those cultures, of course, that you can't separate it from hip hop, but then also like the importance of those other parts of the tradition that literally just become, it's because it's culture, right? So it's literally just what these people are breathing, you know, and, and living every day. And you can't be like, okay, we're only going to take this part of the culture when we talk about hip hop. It's like, yeah, no, it makes a difference because like you said, um, I remember one time we were... Um, the gods and earths in, 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 in New Haven, what you call New Haven, Connecticut. And the woo came through, you know, and, you know, at, at that time, you know, the majority of them, you know, you know, they're, they're five percenters. They're like over half of them are like strict vegans. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But you know, the, so they can't just stop and eat somewhere. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Like, you know, like they have to know like, yo, where are we going to get a grub? So we had a spot my 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 fruit Naru Al Kim, um, they had a spot called the Ivy League, and and, and in that spot, some of the herbs came through, and they 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 threw down and stuff. So after the uh, the concert, Wu came through and 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 ate and everything. But like those kind of things kind of get missed a lot of mm -hmm. time when we talk about hip hop. You know what I'm saying? In terms of like yeah, no, it makes a difference in terms of what they eat and where they eat. You know, and how they eat. It you know? makes and a it huge is, difference. Eat. It makes a huge right. difference. And a lot of the first, a lot of the first vegan recipes and a lot of the first reasons why I started to really focus on a lot of vegan food is from working with Vegiza and uh, Dreddy Kruger and just came out when I was right at Angelus Records, which was owned by, again, DJ Khalil, Chase Infinite, mm -hmm. and DJ, DJ Muggs from Cypress Hill. And mm -hmm. they, I, we shot that video when uh, Justice Allah made the record with Muggs. We shot the music video for it, and I did the casting, and I co-produced it with Chase, and I did the wardrobe, and I did all this different stuff, but at the main point, Everyone who was there, of course, they had to eat. And so I had to go get salad sandwiches for Jizza and Dreddy um, because they were strictly vegan already at that point. They were some of the earliest mm -hmm. vegans that I came across in hip hop. And it's mm -hmm. funny because for a long time when I was launching the Golden Nutrients and when I was putting together, you know, the, the platform and starting to talk more about food and, and hip hop and the intersections, I had in my bio for a long time, the only person that I cook pork for is Thurston Howell III, the Polo Rican. I remember. And, that, yeah. and that's funny because I actually cooked all of these different pork dishes for him and it was in my rest and it was the same place where when Doom would come record or he would come uh, stay there, you know, when he had meetings in New York or or when he was coming to do graffiti with his uh, graffiti partners or whatever it was. But it was the same place where I lived and I was a vegetarian and all these people would come and eat. And I didn't even want to use my pots and my pans and my kitchen and my house. But, you know, that was that was his his culture. And at the time he was, you know, eating any and everything. And literally the only person that I can ever think of that I ever made any pork for. And I made him like three meals in a row that had pork in them. So 
it's so funny because I, I told him how I had been to the island. And at that time, he had never been to Puerto Rico. He's a, you know, cool. he's Puerto Rican with both parents, Puerto Rican, and had never been to the island. And I had. And I told him right. how I was on the beach and I had to wait two hours for them to make me mofongo because in my broken Puerto Rican Spanish, I speak good Mexican Spanish, but Puerto Rican, not so much. So when I was down there on the island, I had to explain to them in my broken Puerto Rican Spanglish about, you know, no, please, no, no pork, no manteca, no, I, I can't eat seafood. I can't eat this. I was trying to explain to them, I, I, my food has to be vegetarian or it has to be vegan. I can't, I can't do it. I literally waited for two hours for them to make me some pounded plantains with garlic and lime <laughs> and vegetables because everything had pork and shrimp in it. Right. But right. they wanted me to eat the food. They wanted me to enjoy their culture. Once I was able to give them that understanding of what it was and why it was, they took the time to make me a special dish that I could eat. And it was delicious and amazing. So when I told Thurston about this, I told him, I said, your Puerto Rican food without the pork in it is amazing. You have to let me cook it for you. You got to try it. So what he told me was this. He said, well, if it don't have pork in it, then it's not real Puerto Rican food. Let me tell you how now he's a vegetarian, mostly vegan. Stop. Stop. I promise you. Are you, you. kidding me? I promise <laughs> you. I Yo, promise some, you. So, well, this is the other thing, which, so for right now, um, you know, I'm in Portland right now. That's where I'm mm -hmm. at. We, long story. But I'm in Portland and, you know, there's a billion and one quote unquote vegan places mm -hmm. right but I'll tell you I can count on one hand how many of them are flavorful none right? <laughs> and, <laughs> two of them that, that, that's the key many times in terms of when people hear healthy food they, they you know are health food you know they hear oh it ain't got no seasoning that junk is nasty you know what I'm saying mm -hmm. and Rightfully so, because how it's been promoted, you know, and generally also a lot of people who are promoting it, who own these kitchens and everything, they're not cooks, period. Mm -hmm. so, you know, they have the the right ingredients, but you don't know how to put it together. They don't, sometimes they don't have all the right ingredients. But what it gets down to is things that are good for you are things that help you in terms of your health, um, especially when it comes from a food dimension, you know. You make a non-believer into a believer just by cooking something that tastes good. Mm -hmm. That's a simple thing. I have no problem with people eating my food when I cook it because I know how to cook. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? So therefore, my food many times isn't when I cook, I don't promote it as even vegan. I'm just like, yeah, this don't have animal products in it. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Try it. Mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? And and mm -hmm. then people let down the guard and, and you know, they eat it. But many times the, the reason why people haven't made that move is because, like you said, one, people don't respect their cultural traditions, you know, and demonize them. Mm -hmm. And two, you know, they just never have a, a good meal or people that literally care about them. You got to have people like that cook for you that care about you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Love is the most important ingredient in in the food, you know, and that that speaks to and testifies as to why I was willing to dirty up my kitchen to make those pork dishes for Vic, because that's that was my right. my friend and someone that I was, you know, uh, helping with business and stuff like that, and someone I cared about, and someone that I wanted to extend that caring and that sisterly love to say, we're over here working, let's not get restaurant food let's not spend money getting some questionable you know food from some place we don't even know like let me cook this food for you with with love even though at that time making those dishes was extremely outside of my comfort zone and outside of my culture and my beliefs right but, right right you know i think that that is one of the main reasons why i created the golden nutrients it's one of the main reasons why I, you know, people were up in arms when I made the recipe for the vegan bean pie for the first time and published it 
but I was careful, you know, to give the history of the bean pie. And I was careful to make sure that all of our different nations had access to the recipe. And, and I've made, you know, I've made bean pies for, for Puerto Rican brothers who are in the, in the, not just in the nation of Islam, but in the fruit of Islam with coconut mm-hmm. as one of the ingredients. Cause I made some coconut bean pies for my Jamaican friends and they loved, loved, loved. And I put up pictures and a couple of the Puerto Rican brothers from the nation reached me and they were like, yo, I, I know that coconut is not in the eat to live, but how about me ordering some of those coconut bean pies? <laughs> right, 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 right. I ain't you know? going to front. I ain't going to front. I, I, I was about to travel when you had the freaking, the THC infused bean pies. <laughs> yeah, my, 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 myself, my, uh, I'm here on the West Coast now. I'm, I'm gonna make it down there because I still wanna, I still wanna experience that. But y- 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 yo, I remember that, yo. I remember when that, but that's the other thing. And, and this is why I want people to know that, like, the dishes that I've seen you produce, you know, like, they're not just, I hate to just use the word healthy by themselves because they, they are, they're culturally competent. You know what I'm saying? Like they're dealing with indigenous ingredients. They're dealing with, mm-hmm. you know, um, you know, historical um, cultural recipes, you know, in, in a, in a, in a, in a flavorful, healthy way. That's just like, it just hits you. Like it hits your eyes, you know what I'm saying? So I can't even imagine how it hits your stomach. You know what I'm saying? So like, that's so important because the health field overall, and even like, a lot of the healthy eating field overall is very, very white dominant. And so what happens is, is that people forget that we have these, all these other cultural traditions that say the exact same thing, but in a way that, you know, we can receive it. So you know many I mean? and so many with spice and so many with flavor. And also when you actually, when you actually do the knowledge, when you go to the local marketplaces, which I have done in every possible big city, every possible culture. I've been to Vietnamese markets, Korean markets, Chinese markets, Japanese markets, Jamaican and Caribbean markets. Um, I've been to all different kinds of Dominican, Cuban, uh, Puerto Rican owned when I lived in New York um, and, and really, really look around the shops they have meat. Some of them, mm-hmm. you know, they do carry pork in, unless it's a, unless it's a culture that's, you know, comes from a more Islamic or, Mus- or Muslim belief or Buddhist, which is often um, a, a, a lot of cuisines are driven by Buddhism as well. And a lot of people don't think of that because they don't think of that as a religion. But with Buddhism and Zionism, they don't believe in killing a mosquito if it bites you. So they for right. surely can't make you a... A, uh, any kind of chicken wing or, you know, anything <laughs> right, that right. You, you think of when you think of Asian cuisine or you think of Chinese food, you think of all these different animal products. But even um, even going back as far as my grandmother and grandfather taking me out for meals, there were always vegan uh, restaurants that we went to in L.A. because a lot of people in my family are Buddhist. And so we mm. would go yeah. to those places. But again, flavor This was not food that tasted like nothing. This was food with ginger and spicy Szechuan chili pepper and all different lotus root and things with so much different flavor and so much variety. And it wasn't to try to make it look like meat or taste like meat or anything. It was, it, it was celebrating the spiritual belief of, of Buddhism. And it was celebrating the fact that you could eat all of these different vegetables and roots and herbs and and that it would taste good and also make you feel great once you were done right. with the meal so that's a big part right. of it too and then a lot of recipes when you look you can see when the colonization came into the recipes and you can see what mm. was added to it and what was changed and you can see how it's so important to still do farming and to still get heirloom seeds and to still Mm -hmm. uh, learn the recipes from the indigenous people and not just go to a restaurant that's named after them or used their, their, they taken their bastardized language to name a restaurant or a cuisine, something like you can go to a Mexican restaurant, quote unquote, Taco Bell, technically, I guess is a Mexican restaurant, 
but right, right. you know, being from LA, Mexico is so much more, first of all, when you're in LA, you're in Mexico. So the same right. roots right. and fruits and herbs and vegetables that are growing a hundred miles down South, they're also growing there. And so the right. yucca, like I grew up my whole life, my grandmother had yucca trees growing on her mountain the whole time. And it wasn't until later in life when I lived in New York and I was seeing all the uh, comida criolla restaurants, the Cuban and Dominican and Puerto Rican food, which always had fried yucca, and which I could mm. never taste because they also fried the chicharron, the pork skin in the same grease. So right. I had to learn how to go to the right market to find the yucca to learn how to get the wax off the outside to learn how to cook it twice to learn how to season it right to learn how to make it before I could ever taste it because I would never and could never eat any food with pork in it right 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 so dag yeah so tell me how it well for for our people who don't know tell tell us about the golden nutrients how did that come about in terms of even buying the golden nutrients itself well the golden nutrients is a is a phrase and it's funny because uh this goes back even further than me knowing doom and the and the kind of new um the new rebranding of kmd that he did when he came out with grim and they had the albums together but in the original kmd lineup there was a brother and his name was Jade, like the like the mineral, Jade One. And he was the original member of KMD along with Sub Rock and Doom. And oh, wow. okay. he stopped working as a working musician with KMD because he was a child. And he went to finish his schooling instead. But mm-hmm. he is the brother who his family lived upstate New York on the very first community that Imam Issa, Dr. Malakazi York ever had. And that's how the Dumale family got to the teachings um, was through him. He's the one, I didn't know any of them back in those days. I'm from California. They were all in Long Island. Um, Right. I didn't meet them until you know, until the the nineties. And so he is the one who came up with the term, the golden nutrients. And he was working on a proposal for a, some kind of food and health based business where he was uh, going to be working with some Chinese nationals and they were going to kind of do a trade of sending healthful foods and products back and forth and of having like healthy food based businesses. And it was in his proposal. And he asked me to read his proposal to make sure the spelling and the grammar and, and all of the points being made were, were, you know, correct. And, and, and the way he was wanting to portray this business arrangement. And I saw the term, the golden nutrients over and over. And so when he finished that project, I asked him, I said, you know, I, I really would like to use that phrase um, in some kind of way. And I was thinking about doing, you know, this free group where I just give knowledge about food and health and everything. And I'd like to really like to call it the golden nutrients. And he was like, well, he's like, I used it in my proposal, but it really just really describes your food and your cooking. And I really think that would be dope. And he gave me the blessing to use it. And that's when, uh, that's when I started that's when I started the group and that's when I started the branding and and the hashtagging and everything. And the reason why still to this day, like, I mean, I've had my recipes published in your books, but I Mm -hmm. myself have not published a cookbook yet or done any content surrounding health or food that's been monetized. I've never, ever done that. And part of the reason why is because like I was talking earlier about my granny and her teaching me, um, you know, about all of the healing properties of herbs and roots and everything that was growing on our land and everything she learned from the Diné, from the Navajo and all the things that she brought with her, with her in her ancestry as well. She told me when she started teaching me and I was just a child, but she told me, she said, anytime you can help, people heal you have to do that and it's not something that 
we charge money for. She said, we're medicine mm-hmm. women and we don't basically like, you know, I say it now in my own terms, healing is not a hustle. Mm. And mm. that's why I did the golden nutrients for free. And that's why I was honored to contribute recipes and articles um, to Supreme Design Publishing and to the books uh, that you worked on and, and edited and wrote so much for and why I've always kept the golden nutrients free and open. And I, I, I'm always so torn about even doing a cookbook because you have to respect your elders. And this is, this is wisdom and knowledge that my grandmother was given by the Jume. Right. right. And so I <laughs> honor them. I honor them right. because that's something that they passed to her and she passed to me and I do not have children. So I have not taught anyone what my grandmother taught me. I hold it with me and I don't feel comfortable going against her teachings or against the, the bond that she made with her word, with the, elders of those tribes on their land when she received those teachings from them it was with honor and I honor my grandmother and I honor everyone who taught her that medicine and the way I do that is if anybody reaches me and says oh my my father had a stroke and he's in recovery and the doctors are saying this and they're saying that but I know you have that nutrients and I know, could you tell me what juices can we do and what herbs can I give and what vegetables and fruits are best for this stroke recovery and what can help with the memory and what can help with the, the muscles atrophying. And this is when people come to me when it's almost too late. Right, 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 right. That's, that's, that says so much. And, and that, that's when you know, I should say it from my perspective, that's when you know that a person is sincere um, because the way the landscape is right now um, in terms of with social media, so-called influencers and all this kind of stuff, you know, there's a lot of people who are out there claiming the role of a healer mm-hmm. and then from it, you know, mm-hmm. um, and and it's, it's, it's frustrating because you know, those of us who has been doing the work for a while, you know, um, we we have these, we always are torn. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? We're always torn because we're in a, we're in a capitalistic society, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so like food, clothing, and shelter, you know, isn't free, mm-hmm. right? Um, you know, yet in tradi- more traditional cultures, you know, in the past, especially if you were, involved in the healing arts you weren't necessarily trying to become a billionaire Mm -mm. but certain of your basic things were taken care of by the people oh definitely so so they understood you know you understood that kind of thing so that you could do the work you you, you're supposed to do so in this society it becomes very hard because you're like yo i'm called to do this work you know i'm saying i do not want to rob the people i'm not there to rob the people um, yet you turn around and there's all these people out there robbing the people, you know, so it becomes a challenge to position yourself so that the people can see the glass of clean water and the glass of dirty water, mm-hmm. you know, um, and, and stay away from those who are, you know, I mean, there's so many, it just, it frustrates me at times because I'm just like, why y'all listening to that person? Can't you see that that person is literally just trying to fleece your pockets? You know what I'm saying? It's frustrating. <laughs> you know, it's it's so funny because I went recently to a grocery store and I was in the aisle and I saw all these different bottles of alkaline water. And first of all, all the alkaline water is in plastic, which drives me crazy. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but when I see these things now, and especially when I see them in a quote unquote, an urban area or quote unquote, the hood you and I in supreme understanding did that. Right. Right. 
And that's not an right. egotistical statement. That's not a statement that's full of hubris. That's none of that. That's a statement that's saying, I, I've had these knowledges in my family for generations. Most did not. And right. I carried, I carried them with me throughout my, my life. And I met certain people mostly through music and mostly through hip hop and mostly through uh, journalism and writing about music and about hip hop. We are the ones who popularize a lot of these things. And it was our collective knowledge, wisdom and understanding what we all brought. And also the fact that it was made accessible. It was made affordable It was made into something that with the hood health handbooks and with the taste of life cookbook and with everything that I did with the golden nutrients, which you've always been a part of that group um, on Facebook as an an admin and someone who I always trusted to be able to post information or anything, just anything of that nature and our collective cultures and his background and Mm -hmm. you being as you've mentioned, the child of people who worked land and worked farms and my grandmother being a farmer and those things that we all, that we all brought, it made them more accessible to all because the books that you all published together made it inside jail houses and penitentiaries they made it onto college campuses they made it onto the bookshelves of the famous and the infamous and the everyday brother and sister who said well i have twenty dollars and i'm on social media with with the god here and i know i i follow his posts and i want to have this cookbook in my collection of the hood health handbook well i like to know more about natural health and beauty or I, I want to be I want to be healthier in my eating habits or I live in a neighborhood that's a food desert but I still want to know what can I make with the few things that are here that I that I can get access to how can I get more access in my neighborhood we did that work right right now you up here sounding like when I have talks with Supreme because that's literally you know, and, and I forget that at times, and, I, and I'll be honest with you, I forget at times because I went through a period where I was very, 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 very frustrated. Okay. Um, you know, but you're you're right. Like that stuff did not happen um, out of thin air. Mm-hmm. And it's it's measurable in terms of when certain work was put in and the result that came from that work over a period of time. You know, um, these kind of talks that you hear sometimes the most random person in your in, in in your mind you know in hip-hop talking about something health-wise it's like oh yeah no nah, no nah, we had it we had a hand in that you Absolutely. know because because honestly there's some people who you're like yeah that person should, there's no way that that person should be talking about health how did they find out about that and then you you come to find out later oh they had this particular connection with this person mm-hmm. or they read this particular article or this particular thing um cuz the a big part of the narrative or the whole discourse was just make like you said making it accessible but also making not just health accessible but the language of health accessible and i think that's a big part that we definitely played a hand in mm-hmm. you know what, growing up like you know, what, if you th- only think of health in the terms of what, you know, Western society presents and everything, one, it's not really cool. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's not really fly. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Um, but when we start connecting the different things that connect to health and realize that these are things that's been in our communities for all along um, and certain things are health things, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, I can get with that. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And, um, we're at a point now, you know, where, you know, we, we could have predicted it, but we had a point now during a, you know, the, where we are right now in society where, yeah, health is like the number one topic being talked about. Oh, you know? definitely. And especially <laughs> anything pertaining to what can you ingest or consume that's going to help 
keep your immune system strong. Yes. Um, it's like, you know, those are big, big factors that, that are coming up more and more and more. And I think that people in this country are realizing more and more that um, your immunity is not going to be as strong when you're over consuming animal products. Cause I'm not, I'm not that one, you know, I'm not the one who, who tries to vilify someone for what they eat or don't eat or, right. you know, right. I, I, I can pretty much deal with, with, like I said, I mean, I, I made pork chops and pork sausages for, for Thurston Howell the third, because that was the, you know, the food that was going to give him the strength and the comfort on that day at that time. And then without right. my, without my influence, he eventually turned to the the lighter side and now is involved in vegetarianism, veganism, healthful eating. He says he does a lot of soups um, and he doesn't eat pork at all anymore. And, you know, like it, there, it's a journey. It is a journey. Most people do right. not, most people don't start out, you know, thinking as a child, like, oh, these, these carrots and bell peppers are going to be so delicious dipped in this this hummus that's whipped up chickpeas and, and sesame paste and garlic and lemon and salt. Like that's not right. Like, most people are like, Oh no, I don't like the way that looks. I, no, I don't, I don't want to eat that. And we're taught also. And again, this is not, it's not indigenous. It's not what our ancestors did or ate or had. It, it was out of necessity, like things like, things like, like, collard greens or like they cooked it damn near to death and added the pig to it because that was all there was for a lot of people to eat in that particular in those regions and in that culture and these are people who a generation before were likely Muslim or part of Yoruba and they likely were eating yam and you know things that definitely did not have any pig in it and what you know but it, this right. was what this was what there was this was what was available to them and so those are you know those are the things that that came from from that from that portion of time and space and it's like they had to rejoin and reconnect with culture and also join in communal existence and join back into uh, farming and on this soil. And to do that, it had to connect with indigenous people who were already here. A lot of whom also had the same melanated complexion that they had and you know that that part is the part that gets cut out a lot when you talk Mm -hmm. about food in the americas and history of eating in the americas is that of course like the impact that colonization had on the aboriginal people who were here it was also decimation right 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 and so that's why we end up with, you know, um, you know, uh, creations like, you know, quote unquote, you know, and, and yes, they've been, you know, rebranded and reappropriated and appropriate, appropriate is not the word, but like things like fry bread, for example, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? Um, definitely how the freaking U.S. forces were using uh, alcohol against, mm-hmm. you know, and it's, and it's like, yeah, like those whole systems were like you said, decimated. Like literally, when they came here, there, there, it was less of what foods are here, more so like how can we bring our foods from our country in Europe and make them thrive in an environment that we don't even know mm-hmm. what the environment is. Exactly, you with know? no aforethought of how that would uh, miscegenate the native crops. Right. No forethought whatsoever about that, or even. No, just just typical typical colonizer behavior. No caring, not only about the people, but also what would it do to their land? What would it do to the animals that are native that are already there? What would it do to what would it do to the crops and 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 just you know and also changing food from something that was 
everything, something that you grew, something that you tended to, something that you prepared lovingly, something that you shared, something that if you did visit another area, you would bring them your food. They would bring mm-hmm. you their food, uh, maybe maybe a plant, but more likely something prepared and you would share and then you would learn that way and you would say, oh, well, they have a they have a purple potato and we have the orange yam and the way that they, they brought the food that was made with that purple potato. When I go back to my place, I have the, the orange yam and I'm going to make it similarly to how they made it. That's what mm-hmm. it was supposed to be. But then right. it got turned into this, it, it was commodified. And when it was commodified, um, it was turned into a thing of like, oh, we can make money off something that people need to survive and thrive. And it removes the love from it. It removes the origin of it. And there was no thought about, oh, well, we're going to be destroying all of this. I mean, that still happens with um, with corn because of the way yep. that corn survives and thrives is by the wind and by the, you know, by, by nature um, pollinating and moving it around. They they've decimated so much original corn by growing the Monsanto corn for which they're paid in census. And a lot of times nowadays when farmers are about to lose their land, if yep. they have the choice of the government giving them this money to grow this GMO product, a lot of times it isn't even really a choice anymore. Or if their access to water is going to be denied because water right. is modified. And so if they can't, especially here in California, there's huge drought. Even in the last five years, when you drive from uh, Northern California down south, you drive through the middle, you drive through all the farmland. Ten years ago, it was green. The crops were growing. The walnut trees and the almond trees were off the hook. The avocado trees, everything was beautiful. Everything was green. And the last, the last time I went, which was right before this pandemic stuff started, everything is brown. There's no water. Farms have made makeshift signs, and they put them up on the roadside so that the passerby will know that it's it, they're being decimated intentionally by the government and by the water companies and by, uh, you know, the powers that be that don't even want them uh, farming anymore if they're a small farm. Because if you could put them out of business, take over the land and put the GMO products on it, that's more money in the in the oppressor's pocket. And that's what they that's what they want to do. And Nestle bottles a lot of the water that used to be going to crops. Nestle bottles it and sells it all over the world. They just take it from, yeah. from my state. Yeah, and they, and they they do that. That's the and that's the root of the problem with um, with uh, Lord, why get I, the, the the sad thing is so many things are going on. Yeah. I lose track of all the time, but it's that's the the water crisis up near what's the name? Land in, back, um, Dakotas, the the pipeline. Yeah, yeah, like like all that kind of stuff. Nestle's like yo, you know, the poison water and and the, and, the, and all that kind of stuff. It's like okay, there's clean water, but the people who live here, they're not going to get access to it. Mm-hmm. We're gonna bottle it and, and put it you know somewhere else you know but no it, it's 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 real you know and that's why that connection needs to come back because you know understanding in terms of the process the cycle how food gets from the farm to your table is important you know and then re- um, taking out as many middlemen as you can mm-hmm. is important too you know mm-hmm. and that gets into localizing seeing, you know, there's foods in our local areas that we don't even eat anymore because we don't even recognize them as food, you know, mm-hmm. it goes back, you know, to, to, to the stage. It also involves, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, work that needs to be done against these big corporations because there ain't no reason that nobody should be taking water out of state, you know, for a big corporation. Not during a drought, not especially Californians under a huge drought. And we're also having a lot more wildfire. There's a huge fire burning right now, which is a word. We're, we're not even in fire season, quote unquote. And there's a huge fire in Big Sur that's that's threatening a lot of forests. And it is already burned down part of a big bridge that people use to travel and commute. And the, the water is also gone when it comes time to put out these fires. And so, you know, that's something that my grandmother uh, taught me, which is something that she learned from from the Diné again, she said, you know, that we, we would look out over, over the mountain and be able to look out at the whole Los Angeles. And at night, you know, all you can see as far as the eye can see, except up on our mountain was just 
lights, electricity, um, pollution, the smog laying over the the low the low lying areas of the valley and the city of Los Angeles itself. And, you know, that's something that she taught me as a very young girl. She said, well, you know, man and mankind and their machines and their inventions and especially you know, all these things um, that the white man uses are um, contraptions. And mm-hmm. they're not, they're not built to last. She, she said, you know, they're, they're against nature. They're against mm-hmm. man, woman, and child. They're against animals. Mm-hmm. They're against flora and fauna. They're against everything that's, that's natural and everything that we were given on this earth to live and breathe free and to enjoy and to procreate and to continue. And she said, you know, it's not uh, something that's going to last. And I think, you know, that whether you, whether you hear that stated in a different way by the honorable Elijah Muhammad, if you go listen to old, old speeches uh, of Mm -hmm. his, whether you hear that from the Lakota tribe or from in the Diné wisdom or whether you, no matter in what language you hear that, no matter in what, language you read that no matter how that lesson comes to you you will hear that exact same thing stated over and over and over again and I think that with this uh, pandemic thing and all of the economic uh, things that are happening now you see more people organizing you see people quitting their jobs in mass you see people mm-hmm. forming labor unions you see people right. leaving their jobs to do entrepreneurial efforts which a lot of times is including Uh, doing small farming or growing one heirloom crop or making one food product or uh, making one health and beauty product that they're doing at home in their own kitchens. You're seeing a lot more uh, DIY and a lot more people saying, you know, I'm not going to participate. I'm not going to participate in this because now not only is it you know, fuckery, but it's also like the the economics of it. And also the fact that people are like, wait a second, I'm not in danger, my life and, and the life of my family for this poor job that doesn't pay well. And there's no health care. And I have to force my children to go into a dangerous educational system. These are things that we've been saying for decades and decades exactly. and decades. Exactly, exactly. And we're here now. You're right. Yeah. We're here now. And, you know, I know that the powers that be and, and, and understandably so many people, because many people also, including the powers that be, wanted to go back to what it was. But the reality is, it's not, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not going back to whatever you thought it was, because whatever you thought it was, was already falling apart. You know, this is pretty much just mm-hmm. that, that, that last nail in the casket. And and all those things you're saying is just, it's the time we're in right now. Like people, um, they got a little breathing time, a little thinking time. Mm-hmm. And, and you're right, they're not, they're not going back. They're not, I, literally every job here that I've seen is looking for somebody to work. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because, like you said, people are are, are they fed up right there? They're like, yeah, nah, um, I'm not going to do that for that amount of money um, to be mistreated and to not have benefits and not have health care. When I could literally, people are willing to struggle mm-hmm. instead of work for people um, that will treat them wrong. Mm-hmm. You know, so like it's it's important for us to, to, I think, just for a lot of people to just you know get in tune with like this world that we want to see. And figure out, you know, what our particular role in the creation of it, you know, is because, um, like I said, it's not going back and everything that you listed, everybody, they're seeing this now, they're seeing this more and more and they're realizing it's just like, man, we really need to depend on each other. And so you really have to find like your circle, like who is your circle, who are those people who who hold your values and how can you link with them to create tangible change and tangible things and yeah. and that's also a reason why i was like yo it's about time i just call up while because this is <laughs> too long you know also outside of this we need to get some things popping too Definitely. um i want to kind of, I want to kind of mm-hmm. roll this up though um could you let people know where can they find you i'm going to list all this stuff when i 
post the um the episode on all the platforms but let people know where they can find you where they can find your work um all that kind of stuff of course uh well on most platforms i am at Wallasia, which is w a l Asia, like the continent, while Asia. And then on Instagram, I'm Noor Science. That's N O O R Science. Um, and the group on Facebook, which is again, is free. It always will be free. No advertisements, no, no money ever due, no promotional, nothing, no sponsors, just free, healthy recipes and information for the people. It's called the Golden Nutrients. And if you type that in in Facebook, it is a Facebook group. Um, so I'm on Twitter as Walesha, um, Walesha Shabazz on Facebook. Um, and there is one other Walesha in the whole world that I know of. And it's a young woman named Walesha Vincent. And she is uh, someone who has a rare form of cancer. And I only found out about her by Googling uh, my name. So I was looking for wow. an article and I discovered her mother and I discovered her. And I think that she might be doing better in, in remission the last time I checked. But for the most part, when you Google the name Walesia, I'm the only person that's going to come up. But if you do see Walesia Vincent, uh, follow her pages, follow along with her with her journey, um, because she's an amazing and resilient young black woman. And her uh, mother has been real steadfast about her her healing and, and trying to help other people with her same condition. Um, but with the exception of Wallace Vincent, Wallace is pretty much always going to be me. Um, and then I do have a lot of writing online. I have uh, northscience.medium.com, which has just a lot of various articles. Um, I do have finally a cookbook in progress. And yes. what I was saying earlier about not, wanting to commodify my work in any way, the way that I've been able to kind of justify doing this cookbook is that it's the intersection of everything and it's stories about hip hop and other musical artists that I've worked with, whether at record labels or in their staff or at magazines, people I've interviewed, um, their favorite recipes, things I cooked for them, their culture and how their culture dictates what they can and cannot eat and how that led me to create certain dishes for them or make them certain foods. And uh, so it's really kind of a everything all rolled into one book um, and it will be called uh, something with the golden nutrients in the title or the subtitle and it's forthcoming. I'm editing and I'm doing recipe testing and all the things that come along with doing a cookbook. Um, and then I have a short ebook of juices and smoothies that's going to be sooner than that and it's just going to be digital and it may or may not have an app to go along with it which would be like a daily juice or a daily smoothie type of thing um but i'll definitely keep uh, everyone posted about that and I'm, my goal and determined idea is to have that up for my earth day which is april 6th yes 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 i'm here for all of that <laughs> all of that yo um and you know just let you know you know i'm making it down that way this <laughs> year that last year kind of threw me off i'm making it down that way and when i make it down that way i'm gonna let you know way in advance because okay. I, I need to have some good eating um <laughs> you know i i just there's there's gonna be a part two at some point because there's just so much more i could just talk to you about all this but i just also want to just um emphasize that it's important for people <clears throat> who are sincere about this kind of work to, for lack of a better term, claim their spot mm -hmm. because, uh, and, and this is pretty much talks I get with Supreme all the time, because if we don't claim this spot, those pretenders are the only ones left in the spotlight mm -hmm. and then people don't know where to go. Mm -hmm. And 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 while we and while we struggle with like yo, I don't want to be a ten percenter. I don't want to, you know, rob the people. Mm -hmm. You already aren't that person. You know what I'm saying? The 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 by by virtue of the fact that you are already wrestling with that in your head, kind of already shows that you're not that person. You know what I'm saying? So like, it's important for those though, like I said, that are sincere to claim the spot because we've seen over the last few years, um, especially with this pandemic in terms of how all of a sudden all these experts pop out from the woodwork. I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you, are you kidding me? Because uh, you know this is what I do, but meanwhile, you are the new expert now. 
Gotcha. Mm -hmm. The you new know, expert, like, exactly. The new expert, mm -hmm. you know, because people need to see the real, you know what I'm saying? So so I salute all the all all the projects and everything coming. Thank I you. know that I could push and support. Thank um you. I would yeah, love to see one more volume of the Hood Health Handbook with the emphasis on holistic healing herbs, the natural basis for man-made and synthetic pharmaceuticals and over-the-counter drugs. I would love to help in creating that book. I would love to uh, be a part of editing and of adding on to it and of using some. I have a lot of my grandmother's books right here to my right, right next to my bed, and some of which I wanted to somehow incorporate into a cookbook. But I would love for us to be able to provide that book to the people because right now I think that's what's really, really needed is to go deeper than just food and beverage and right. what we actually ingest, but also to go deeper into the science of maybe don't take that antibiotic that the Western doctor gave you because we have this oregano oil, we have this garlic oil, we have this ivy leaf, we have all of these um, things at our disposal. We have this cayenne and this ginger. And why don't you give right. that a try and see right. how you fare with it? Because you're willing to try a pill, you have no idea what's in it or where it came from. Right, right. And many times it's funny because um, I think I've only had an antibiotic once in my life. Mm -hmm. Oh, I did. Once in my life when I was in college, my second year in college, I got bronchitis really, oh. really, really bad. Um, I didn't know what was going on. Um, and I ended up going back home still with it. Into that, They gave me the antibiotic, but was Here's here's the the caveat though. Um they gave me penicillin. <gasps> I didn't know. I didn't know that in my family. Oh no. I'm allergic to penicillin. Oh so I broke out with hives. I told people I was itching in parts of my body that I didn't know existed. My tongue, you can I can stick up my tongue, you can see the hives on my tongue. Oh, I'm itching in the blood, you know. But um what I mentioned that because later on in life at a job I was working, literally people would get like the sniffles, mm -hmm. no lie. And the doctor would be prescribing them, you know, antibiotics. I was mm -hmm. like, so did you have an infection or something? They're like, no, nah, they just get, I was like, no, like I know enough about antibiotics to know that you're not just supposed to be getting it for that. Mm -mm. You know? So this is the other thing. It's like, a lot of people are getting stuff that's not even, even according to uh, Western medicine, is not being applied properly. You know, so it's like it. it yeah. Okay. I'm with it. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's uh, let's I'm, let's I'm, let's do I'm, it. And and also we have to make sure that we have a chapter about minor surgery and minor first aid at home as well, and having those those products and those tools available. Because guess what? Right now, if you cut yourself at home and you require stitches, you would be better off knowing how to do that at the house. Oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Because also the way that things are set up right now, you know, um, you might not even be able to get into who, you know, a doctor's office, Exactly. you know, um, the, the, the ERs are filled up, you know, doctors are primarily only doing, uh, you know, zoom kind of things, mm -hmm. you know, um, and it's a time, like, I know people who are supposed to have, like, important surgeries mm -hmm. that are being pushed back mm -hmm. because of everything. So if there's, like, some basic, as much as we can take care of ourselves, we should empower ourselves to take care of ourselves on that level, you know. So I'm with it. Let's, 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 talk, it. let's talk about it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. Listen, y'all, uh, once again, thank you so much for um for this interview. It's, it's just great just catching up with you and just, you know, just shooting it. Um, and I definitely would like to do a part two at some, you know, somewhere down the line. Um, and yeah, let's do it. Definitely. Thank let's you. do it. And thank you so much. And after you listen and after I listen, I think I might've missed a couple answers and I'm sure you have other questions. We could also do something in writing for those people who still do read since you and I are so deeply rooted in reading and yes. writing. <laughs> yes. Yes. All right. yes. Thank you. I, I, peace. Peace. Yo, light is crazy shit, yo. Light is crazy shit.